I, I actually had a conversation with someone this morning from um, uh, this, from DOT in Washington, uh, one of the assistant secretaries, and I, I said, I assume you brought with you a satchel of money for the MTA. <laughs> and she said, uh, she said that, well, yeah, we, I, you already have a satchel from us. And I said, well, I've got to take you down to Costco and get you a bigker satchel. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that, was as far as, uh, that, that was as far as we got. Okay, if I can call this to order, thank you. Um, approval of minutes. May I have a motion? Do I have a second? second. Approved? Thank you. Um, we have the work plan and commitments completions update. So to Linda, please. Uh, the work plan remains largely the same. We have added in September uh, to do an update to the board on the uh, smart card effort that's underway. So that's a new addition to the work plan. Um, for commitments and completions, uh, we committed 1.77 billion or 94% of the commitment goal. Um, for year to date, and we had 1.75 billion or 85 percent of the goal for completions. The largest fall off for completions um, was New York City Transit's Columbus Circle Complex and um, Charleston Annex. Um, starting in September, we will be bringing forward a more robust commitments and completion reports reflecting uh, the approval of the 10 to 14 program and anticipated commitments moving forward. So that will come in September. Questions? Um, I'm actually very happy we're doing the smart card update here. I think it's a, it's a fundamentally critically important program for us. Um, we, by September, we'll have a few months of, of uh, experience with this. And, and the key thing, I think, for us is really about how we drive off of what we're doing right now to actually get to the implementation of a program, right? Because the pilot is, is only a step along the way, and we need to actually start to really focus on uh, on being able to do that. So I'm glad that Amy's going to come here and start to start to have that discussion in September. It's the right time. It's good timing. Anything else on that? No. Okay. Um, we had uh, in the last CPOC meeting, if you recall, Michael gave an update on Second Avenue Subway, and there were a number of questions that were raised by board members at that time um, for which we didn't want to let any grass grow and, and wanted Michael to come back to, to being able to speak about it. I'm, I'm actually going to invite him, if he wouldn't mind, to come somewhere um, south or east, west, uh, west. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that we can actually find him. Uh, but I, I, we thought it was important to, to and, and I think it's a as a matter of practice because of the importance of some of these projects not to, not to just let it go one month, two months, but, but come right back and, and be able to address it. So, Michael, I think there were three questions, if yep. I'm not mistaken, and that you have robust answers to all three. Is that accurate? Okay. It's in your hands. Absolutely accurate. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, product production of the TBM. Um, we have yet to achieve the type of production that I, would have, I was hoping. We were plagued by a lot of uh, technical problems, um, but uh, and also the ground was somewhat unexpectedly uh, difficult to go through. Yet I believe that as of Saturday, and they did work Saturday to try to make up some time, uh, we had the real first good productivity date on Saturday. Uh, and um, at this point, as we stand right now, I am. Uh, Pretty confident that we going we are going to meet our goal to finish that early January 2011, and then we're going to pull back and go the other way. So uh, I will come back if you want. I mean, I mean, no, for sure I'm coming back in September because this is three months, um, and uh, at that time I'm hoping that we're going to give you much better news. At this point, uh, we had lots of issues with the with the equipment. Uh, including having to replace uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of stuff on a high-speed conveyor that came from Switzerland that even the CEO flew here to fix it and so forth. So I believe that on the technical part we are past and we are uh, out of the bad ground at this point. So I'm actually optimistic that we're going to see much better results when I come back. The other two issues, one was the award. Yes. Yeah. second. What would be the time frame in which, I mean, it's, we do have a little bit of a pause because there are no meetings that are taking place in August. So what would be the time frame in which, you know, if, if for example, 
uh, in a couple of weeks, would you have a sense that you've really hit the, I mean, is that, how much time does it take to actually feel that you will know the answer about whether or not you have this sort of steady rate of production, which is the key to what I you're talking about. I would say about. that based on what I've seen now in my discussion with the, with a, uh, over the weekend with a contractor, and actually I'm seeing the contractor today as well, um, they believe they're going to be out of the bed ground um, this week, and they're going to go in. They're hitting actually good rock that they can, can work through. Um, regarding the uh, technical issues, I mean, the, the breakdowns and so forth, quite frankly, that they are not able to predict. The only thing they've done is they stockpile additional spare parts and, and motors, and so if there is an issue, they will be able to replace immediately. Uh, so I would say that in a couple of weeks we should kind of hit a stride, that we will know where we are. So can I ask you to just, since we don't have a meeting in August. Send you an email. Would you, well, send an email to the members of the board, just with a, you know, it could be three sentences if you want. Yeah. But, but just actually updating us on the production, and, and are we now in a mode of getting that, that uh, production Not uh, solidified? Problem. Not a problem. I'm sorry, Green. And the format of that, I'd, I'd like to know how many feet per day we're traveling that metric. Yeah, and we, I, I'm getting, look, I'm getting daily reports on how much we travel per shift. So, quite frankly, you are welcome to have the same report I do. I'll just summarize it for you in a graphic form, and you can have the backup for it. Well, two things. How many feet per day? And then I'd like, it would be great to have a sense of physically where the machine is. Is it at 85th Street? Is it at, so we can all mentally kind of track? No problem. Thank you. Second thing was the ground freezing. Uh, the contract was negotiated, and, and uh, we are moving forward. So that's out of the, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fine. Uh, the third thing had to do with the uh, fragile buildings. Uh, happy to uh, uh, report, uh, number one, that we already have brought back a couple of the families in one of the buildings as of this Saturday. Um, we are moving forward to the repairs up in the 96th Street area. So that's, uh, uh, we have right now um, uh, to perform work on uh, about four or five more buildings. Everything else is under uh, underway right now. Um, at uh, 72nd Street, we had 88 buildings. All have been surveyed. Uh, they have been categorized based on uh, their, the, the, the type of repair and the, the level of repair. Uh, we have 20 buildings that are at this point categorized as being the most severe ones or the closest, the, the closest also to, to um, uh, a potential impact. And 13 are the very minor stuff. Um, at this point, we're working with the Department of Buildings to finalize that and to understand how much of the work we need to do and how much we will not. Uh, we have uh, a number of buildings, four buildings, that we have actually uh, notified them on an urgent type way in the sense that, that they, they, they were issuing violations to the landlords uh, regarding the, those buildings. Um, I have had a meeting with the elected officials uh, that represent the uh, constituency along 2nd Avenue, uh, and they were basically... Uh, shown and, and, and we, we shared with them the information. They all know what's going on. Uh, and at this point, um, there was a question that they raised as to what is the probability that we may need to temporarily relocate uh, uh, um, uh, tenants. And I would say that uh, I'm going to say opt cautiously optimistic that we will not have to, but is cautiously optimistic. I don't have yet everything that because we are now designing some stuff, so I cannot tell for sure, but, but it looks as if we will not have to. But just, just one question. These buildings, are they in as close proximity to uh, actions that we've been taking as the 97th Street buildings? Because at 97th Street, we're, we were... We're doing we are the launch box. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So is there a chance yeah. that they ca we can say, hey, listen, uh, these ha the problems with your buildings are not caused by anything we're doing. Or um, can we make that case with um, a straighter let face? Me, let me say the following. Um, uh, uh, this is just uh, 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 an engineering judgment uh, on my part. Uh, I would say that most of the stuff, if not all of it, uh, is not 
uh, not much to do with us. Yet, we are there, and, um, and we do not want to be in a position to delay the project by the mere fact that we may have, that our vibration from, from uh, the TBM, someone may construe that, that uh, we are now worsening a, an existing condition that was bad to start with. So I believe that as a, uh, making a business decision, the right thing is if we believe that we're going to have an effect, we need to fix it so we will move forward. The cost of not doing that is higher than what we need to spend in fixing some stuff. So actually, at the end of the day, I believe that we're going to leave Second Avenue a much better place than we found it. Not only will we have a subway, but we'll have better buildings. Other questions? Michael, thank you. I, look, I, I appreciate your coming back quickly, and I think keeping this dialogue at this juncture in the project, I think it's very appropriate to do so. I would also note uh, for the committee that um, I, I attended with Michael and, and with the mayor uh, one of the uh, most fun things that I've had the opportunity to do since I was here, which was to see the final uh, six feet, I think it was, of the tunnel boring machine for the number seven line extension. And, um, you know, the sense of, of things really happening in progress and seeing it as a fully bored tunnel when it, uh, when, when that happens was, was, was just terrific. And I think sometimes we get caught, as we should, in the details of these major projects that we're doing. I mean, they are, they are fundamentally difficult. They're fundamentally expensive. Um, but, but we are, you know, in the process as well of, of making progress and reshaping uh, areas of New York. And I think that's uh, occasionally within there. We might be able to see glimmers of that. Um, and, and I was happy to be able to do so. You're able to see the uh, lights at the end of the tunnel, number seven, right? Uh, literally and figuratively, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, you know, you can you can really see this happening now, and I think that's uh, I, I think that's you can particularly see it happening when you walk over and see the tracks when they left when they built the number seven line to begin with. They left the lead tracks to be able to do this. I mean, you literally look, and it feels a little bit like being a kid and connecting the. The last piece of the Brio set that, that's, that's sort of missing that you're, that you're putting there is what remains to be done. So um, I'm sure it's not quite that simple, but uh, I wasn't that good with Brio either. So. <laughs> it's fun, nevertheless. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the next item is the quarterly update on uh, MWBE participation. And Michael, you're taking that, right? Yes, I am, Jay. And so we met um, last in, in, in April, I guess, and we wanted to look at the MWDBE inclusion rates w with respect by taking all zero goal contracts. You can only apply a goal if there's adequate firms in the marketplace. So we, we, then went the, we then went back and looked at the capital construction projects that we awarded both on our FTA projects and on our state projects, and it was two, $2.6 we looked at we, we looked at the actual DBE number, and it came up to 9%. I also wanted to, to look at how many DBEs worked on our, our, our state-funded projects? And that number came to $97 million. So for 2009, for, for it was three, 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 um, $105 million awarded to DBE firms on all contracts. And so then we wanted to look at, the, at, our, at our state contracts. And so there were $2.6 billion once again. And we, and we looked at these contracts minus the zero goals. And the, the uh, goal for MBE, um, we, we, uh, we, we um, looked, looked at the actual goal, and, and, and it was 12%, and we exceeded uh, that number by two percentage points. We, we looked at the WBE, and that was 6%, and the goal is 5%. I, I, I also wanted to look at the number of MWBE firms who worked on our, our – um, our FTA pro projects, and we found an extra $183 million. And so for last year, there was, there was $249 million that was awarded to M M M BE firms on all of our contracts. So we wanted to look at the first quarter also for 10. And we are currently, with respect to DBE, 16% on page 3. 
and also on page four, we are at 8% MBE and 5% WBE, so we are right, right on target for the first quarter of 10. Are those actual MBE and, and WBE firms or just firms that have subcontractors that meet, that meet the both, goal? Both prime and, and, and subcontracts as well. You know, so we, we, I mean, we looked at, at, at basically in the past of DBE firms only on FTA funded projects. I wanted to look and see how many DBE firms worked on our state contracts and, and, and vice versa also, M, MBE firms working on both state contracts and on, on FTA projects. We found extra monies. Questions on, on this area? Michael, I, I I thought it might be helpful to the committee if you just gave a quick update on the mentoring legislation. Yes. Right. Well, I'm I'm, I'm glad glad to say that that the bill was signed in, into law on the 15th, and as of last Friday became official. So, so the MTA's um, mentor program is now state law. And so as. As Jay indicated, that once once that bill was signed, that he wanted every aspect of, of this program to be finished, and so we are, are finalizing every aspect of the program, and we are ready to go, and we are, we are meeting with the CM firm next week, and we are there, and thanks to Ron's help and, and, and Jay's uh, insistence that all of our agencies get in line, we're, we are there. So it's been a long road, but we're there. Well, that's good because I know at the Long Island Metro North Committee we approved a, one of the two projects this morning to accomplish that. So I'm glad to know we weren't before the legislation, we're actually after the legislation. So because right. we did Stony Brook and we did um, one of the other projects, one of the other Q Gardens. Gardens, right. So that was designed directly for the mentoring program. So we're I'm glad to hear we're moving forward on it. That's very important. And it is really a credit very both important. to Ron and to, to Michael. I mean, I, I think the last thing in the world we wanted after waiting so long to get this legislation was not to do something right away. And I think, I think both of those gentlemen really worked to make sure that we were ready to do it. To hear you say that we were approving the project this morning is exactly the outcome that we wanted to, to see on this. And I think it's a very, very positive uh, step forward. So um, it will remain... You know, this is always a tough road, and you got to be very, very, very uh, vigilant about what we're about what we're doing. And uh, but you know, I think we're we hopefully have turned a corner of being able to to really show some real progress here. I think it will be appreciated and should be appreciated all around. Um, so I think it's very positive. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Linda and Josh, I guess, huh? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're uh, about to go into a presentation on the uh, track program that is not like what we've done in the past. We're not going to look back over the work that we've been doing on track, but instead what I'd like to present to you was a way that we want to work on track moving forward that will bring some analytical tools to our evaluation of what is quite a large uh, part of our infrastructure and our spend to see if there are ways to do this um, job more. Uh, I'm sorry, can we go back to the second page, please? First slide. Um, to see if there are more effective ways to uh, accomplish the, um, the workload that we're doing. So we're going to talk to you about the track program. Um, next. Who's, can I have the next? I don't know. We seem to, this isn't the right. All right. Um, we're going to talk to you about the track program. And, and I don't by any means purport to be uh, the substance expert on track by any means. Those people are here with us today, though. Um, we have Tony Cabrera and Steve File from New York City Transit, um, Elisa Pica from Long Island, and um, Bob Walker from Metro North. So if you have any specific questions on track as we move forward, um, they will be prepared to answer those. But what we want to do today is uh, tell you that we, we're fairly sure that the track program provides safe and effective track, and we'll tell you uh, what's the basis for that. We want to talk about some of the efforts that are currently underway to improve efficiency. We want to talk to you about a new way we want to look 
um, at how we determine if the program is efficient, and um, then about our plans to come back to you. So why do we want to take this new look at track? It's a uh, very large part of our infrastructure. The network, as you can see from this slide, consists of over 2,000 miles of track and over 4,500 switches. That track exists in lots of different environments. There's elevated track. There's track at grade. There's track in tunnels. Um, the switches you see a picture of there, and track comprises a number of elements. There's the rail, the ties, the ballast. Um, so it's quite a large um, part of our infrastructure. In determining the track program, which is a combination of both um, operating and capital, the agencies all have their own individual constraints that they have to keep in mind. Uh, there are the types of track that I just talked about. In addition, there are the operating environments. So for transit, it's the fact that they operate a 24-7 system. There's the amount of traffic that goes over the track because the more traffic, the more wear that you have on track. There's the access to actually maintain or uh, renew track. Um, there are your work methods, and then there are labor agreements. So all of these factors go into the agency's build, if you will, of their programs. Um, the next page shows that it is a large area of spend for us. And the interesting thing is typically when we think about or when I present it to CPOC, we present the capital spend. And you can see that's pretty significant. That's $347 million a year, um, or almost $2 billion over the course of the five-year program. But by looking at that, we, we don't attend to the fact that we also spend $230 million a year on maintenance. So between the operating and the capital side of um, the program, we spend over half a billion uh, dollars a year. And we employ nearly 4,000 people to do both the maintenance of the track and to renew the track. So looking for opportunities to not view the program as siloed from a, from a capital and operating, but rather how do we um, evaluate track from a life cycle cost and are there ways to drive down those costs on either or both sides of the equation is where we want to go. Does the maintenance cost include inspection, or is it? Maintenance costs include inspection. Okay. Linda, one quick question. I'm looking at Metro North versus Long Island Railroad. And I was afraid you were going to do that. Oh, I'm <laughs> No, go ahead. I won't look anymore. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm just wondering why the maintenance budget is so much higher than the capital budget for Metro North when the ratio proportions for the other two agencies are different. Right. And that, that, in fact, is going to be one of the things that we're going to be looking at. Um, I think there can probably be some guesses on that, but, Doreen, that's exactly as we – as we do the process that we're going to talk to you about, which is benchmarking and understand what underlies the elements of each of these, we can, and whether the balance is appropriate, because you can see for, um, in this case, the balance is different for Metro North than it is for the other two agencies. So that's going to be one of the looks that we're going to take. And when we come back to you, which is going to be my commitment, uh, hopefully we'll be able to provide more insight on that. And clearly we're looking at the age of, of yes, the tracks clearly. as we benchmark because there's some very old yes, track that's in the absolutely correct. transit system. And we'll okay. talk a little bit about from some benchmarking that has already been done, you know, what we, what we, what we think we understand as some of the cost drivers behind um, the cost of track and, and what levers you can in fact work to change so that you drive your costs down. And so that's what we're going to be um, some of that may have to do with the weight of the vehicles. Absolutely. And who has the newer vehicles. and The weight of the vehicles and the amount of traffic definitely affects the wear. It's, this, is, this is really not a simple area. to, um, and, and part of what I'm suggesting to you is a little frightening because we've not done this kind of, uh, we internally haven't done this kind of rigorous analysis to try and look at how the agencies compare, try and normalize some of those comparisons for some of the areas of constraint that I talked about, how to see where you have differences and work towards what, what would constitute best practice. And we're going to talk a little bit about there had been some benchmarking work done um, that identified some best practice um, agencies in track, 
And once you um, understand where your benchmarks are not as good as best practice and you delve into what underlies that, sometimes there are opportunities to make improvements, sometimes there aren't. Sometimes your constraints limit you. So it's very possible that when you take this review, you come back and say, you know what, we're as efficient as we can be, but that's going to be the look that we're going to try and take on your behalf. Um, Linda, so, sorry. Linda, in the uh, maintenance count, is there, uh, in the maintenance budget, is that just personnel? Or are there other costs? Um, Joe, Joe, do you know if the costs include? Yes, that, that's uh, maintenance and uh, materials as well. Materials Pers as well. and materials, yes. I'm trying to figure out why for less people it would cost. We're, uh, we're going to come back to you on the whys. That's exactly the point. Even just looking at this starts to raise questions about what's behind this, and that's, that's what we're getting at. You've, you've beat it in right on the, on the issues here. Um, so these resources are, uh, in fact, used by the agencies to ensure us that our track is in a state of good repair. And um, the IEC, the summary that you have of their report in the book, um, they found that the uh, track is, in fact, in a state of good repair. And they determined this largely on the basis of the indicators that they looked at. The agencies set annual renewal goals that they set based on the condition um, and the remaining useful life of the track, where track wears, what their um, inspection um, vehicles tell them they need to do. So they set those renewal goals and largely they meet them. They uh, inspect and maintain track in accordance with their own uh, policies and standards. And um, they all have a relatively low rate of track, re track failures and track related delays which is what you look for and hope to find in an effective program. So we know we have a fairly high confidence level that the program is effective, uh, and the, the approach that we're proposing to take is one designed to look at whether the program is efficient, whether, in fact, taking into account both operating and capital and not siloing these expenses. Do, do we have the right balance? Are there opportunities um, to press any of those levers and to become more efficient. So to take us on that discussion, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Josh Goldwitz, who's currently with Strategic Initiatives at MTA. Uh, before that, though, Josh was with Lloyd's Register that did do a benchmarking study that included a look at track across the agent, across various um, metros, um, subway um, systems, including New York City Transit. He's going to talk a little bit about that and how we intend to apply that approach to our own um, track program moving forward. Josh? Thank you, Linda. What I'd like to do now is to share some findings in the area of track from the Lloyd's Register benchmarking study of metro systems. The headline is that our track program and the state of good repair that it delivers uh, is very effective at uh, improving reliability of our track. However, it comes at a somewhat high maintenance cost. If you look at the chart on the left, we see the number of track failures that cause delays to trains. If you compare the subway to the average of seven other metros that were part of this study, we see that on average the other systems have more than twice the rate of failures. However, if we look at the next chart, which addresses the amount of cost for maintaining each mile of track, we see that on average the other systems have costs that are about one-third lower. Can I stop you right there and ask sure. a question? Um, out, of, out, of, out of the numbers on the left-hand bar charts, the track failure rate, how many of these in each category, or do you know, were, were catastrophic failures that involved a loss of life? Um, it's not something that we looked at, although this data is based on 2007 uh, figures, and none of the participating systems had any such catastrophic failures. Uh, I think it's exceedingly rare. Uh, so these are more just failures that would cause delays and inconvenience. And so by looking at the performance and the cost sides, you know, we see that, um, previous slide please, we see that, you know, we're doing a good job on a performance, but 
there are questions about our cost effectiveness. And in the Lloyd study, what we did is we sought to dig in a bit and understand what are some of those drivers behind track maintenance and renewal costs. And what emerged are things such as labor rate, the number of staff that we have, and track access, which is essentially how much time we have to get out on the track and do work, which is particularly challenging in a 24-7 operating environment. So really, looking at some of these drivers can help us to understand where there may be opportunities to improve cost effectiveness in the future. What, one other question, and I'm sorry I won't keep doing this, but among the peer average, are there any other 24-7 operations? No. Uh, that's a very unique characteristic of the New York City subway. Doesn't that suggest, then, that, that perhaps even though our maintenance costs are high, that 24-7 characteristic has a good bit to do with it? It certainly can have something to do with it. Uh, again, it's, it's something that influences our track access in a somewhat negative way. We can't get out in the middle of the night for a solid block of a few hours the way that other systems are able. And the Yes, we have very high utilization. That's true. Do you, do you have a comparison of the labor costs between us and the other seven Yes. Labor cost is something that was looked at in the course of the study and it was found that the labor cost in uh, New York City is somewhat higher than in the other systems, and that's after taking account of differing costs of living in different countries. Now, the agencies are very much aware of the issue of cost efficiency in the track program, and they've been actively pursuing a number of measures to improve efficiency. I'd like to take a moment to just highlight what a couple of these measures are. In the upper left, we're using mechanization uh, in order to speed up some of our maintenance and renewal processes. For example, this machine that replaces ties very quickly. Um, we're doing surfacing work on our track, which effectively extends the life of the track and also helps to give our customers a smoother ride. We're using computer-based tools uh, in order to increase the productivity of our inspections. And one of the most interesting technology developments is the automated track inspection car. This car has all kinds of sensors, and what it does is it automatically goes down the track and is able to detect any possible flaws that could eventually lead to failures. It's enabling a shift from the old paradigm in track, which was to find where failures happen and fix them. Now we can predict failures and prevent them from ever happening in the first place. Now, in this spirit of continuous improvement, the agencies uh, would like to work with us on further opportunities to be more cost efficient. One of the most promising opportunities, uh, which the Lloyd study pointed to, is the idea of minimizing the total life cycle costs. In other words, the total costs associated with all of the maintenance and renewal activity that we do on our track. If you take a look at the chart that's shown on the slide, um, you'll see a trend that the Lloyd study identified. And what this is is that as track becomes older, it costs more money to do maintenance. And that's driven by the fact that older track sometimes has more failures, so more corrective work is needed. And also, we need to do more corrective work to maintain the state of good repair. So in other words, the younger our track is, uh, the lower our maintenance costs may be. However, on the other side, in order to keep our track young, we need to renew it at a higher rate, and that can tend to drive up our capital costs. So this really points to that trade-off that Linda spoke of earlier. Uh, the question of how we balance our maintenance and capital spends and whether we're looking at it in a joined-up way. In addition, we also uh, can take some of the findings in terms of some of the drivers of track maintenance and renewal costs and take a more in-depth look at where there may be opportunities to make improvements. So in order to really deliver on these savings, we need to take a more analytical approach to how we plan and manage our track work. One way to do that is through benchmarking. Benchmarking is basically a structured approach for identifying and delivering cost and performance enhancements. It's an approach that the agencies have already used in the past with some success. And it's an approach that we feel we can apply towards reducing total life cycle costs. The way that benchmarking works is that we would start with certain key issues. For example, the trade-off between maintenance and capital work. 
We then collect data from each of the agencies that will inform us on the amount that we spend, the amount of activity that we do, and we want to really drill down. We don't want to just look at high-level numbers like cost to renew a mile of track, but we want to know how much of that spend is towards maintenance, uh, excuse me, towards uh, materials, how much of that spend is towards labor, what technologies are in play. Once we have that picture, we can start to look within each agency at what the trends are year to year. We can start to look across the MTA agencies and identify points of difference. And we can even go a step further and, and look externally at outside comparators. The idea is really to develop an understanding of the differences between the agencies and how we spend our money and to identify uh, peers either internally or externally who have strong performance and uh, who may be able to provide lessons that we can translate back to deliver savings here at the MTA. One other thing that I want to highlight is that benchmarking can help to build transparency. We'll have a clearer picture of how we're spending our money and we'll be able to express more fully what we're doing to make every dollar count. So to tie things up, we've seen through the course of this presentation that our track program is very effective at delivering safe and reliable track in a state of good repair. What we'd now like to do is to place more focus on cost efficiency. By drawing together information about our track assets, about how much it costs for us to renew and maintain each mile of track, and by understanding the unique business and operating constraints that face each agency, we can develop a more clear picture of total life cycle cost. Previous slide, please. And from that understanding, we can revisit our strategic year-on-year -year track asset management plan and ensure that not only do we continue to deliver very safe and reliable track, but we are also delivering the greatest possible value and the most cost effectiveness. In the coming months, we will be working with the agencies to explore this framework and any opportunities that it may lead us towards in terms of making improvements. At this point, I'd like to turn it back to Linda to tie up the presentation. Thanks. So, so where are we? we? We believe we have an effective program. We don't want to do anything to change that. We want to continue to have a program that um, delivers a safe and reliable service through state of good repair track. Uh, we want to continue uh, the agencies currently try and drive towards uh, efficiency measures where they can. We want that to continue. Um, we want to work with the agencies to benchmark uh, between ourselves and with our peer uh, properties to I better identify the cost drivers here, uh, understand whether um, the drivers fully account for the cost differences, so the points, for instance, that you raised, Doreen, whether those are dispositive or whether there are other drivers where, in fact, you know, presumably there are some levers that we can push to develop some savings, and that's going to be what we're going to be looking. Or we'll be able to come back and say, you know, the programs are not only effective, but they're efficient. We're just not yet, we don't have enough information yet to be able to tell you that. And given how large the programs are, we want to spend some time our point would be, our, our intent would be to come back to you all in February and tell you what we've learned, uh, give you an update, and um, see where we are. Um, I'm just thinking of those bar charts, the 100 to the 219. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that we're going to accept a greater degree of track failures. No. No, one of the costs one of the interesting um, things in the Lloyd's uh, Register survey was one of those where you look for clusters, and so there are a bunch of agencies clustered at um, high effectiveness, low cost, um, and then there were you know the other agencies that have high effectiveness, high cost. So what we what we want to strive to is to be amongst the cluster as a family of agencies. I, you know, transit was, was used as an exemplar, if you will, because we have the study. But as a family of agencies, we want to strive to be with, given our constraints, and, and to the extent you can normalize, normalizing across the agencies, we want to strive to be in the circle of low cost, high effectiveness.
I'm oh, sorry. Many places in the, uh, in the commuter rails and a fair number in the subway have concrete ties. Are we moving away? Um, is that the program to move away from wood ties to all concrete? Uh, does that actually keep the tracks in uh, better shape for a longer period of time? I'd actually ask one of our uh, track people to speak to that. Kevin, are you offering? Um, let, let me add a summary point here. I, I see Carmen sitting here. I don't see Tom. But if, if Tom were sitting here, he would undoubtedly talk about um, what our track program was like in 1983 or 1982 and the fact that we literally had trains falling off the track. Um, we have made an enormous effort and I think with enormous success in improving our track program. Um, uh, I, I never correct Doreen because I usually don't get the opportunity, but the one correction I give you is we don't have a lot of track that's over age right now. We're, we're, up, we're in good repair, and, 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 we've, and that's been a lot of hard work over a long, a long period of time to be able to do that. But equally, I think your concern that you're expressing um, we, we, is, is one that I share, that, that we can't go back on that. Um, I think what's important about this program um, is that it establishes that effectiveness has to be at the highest level. Um, but now we need to be able to see whether or not we can actually do it more cost effectively or cost efficiently than we've been able to do it uh, so far. The answer to that may turn out to be no. Um, and it may turn out that the answer is different in different agencies and doing other things like that. But I think what this does represent for our organization and does represent at least from what I've seen for this committee and the way that we're taking it forward is a move to be able to use analysis to look at this and move away from some anecdotal answers about what we're doing into that, that type of analytical framework. I'm happy that it's supported by, by all the agencies and also by the strategic initiatives group in, in being able to do it. Um, so I think it's the direction we need to be taking, not just for track, but for many other asset classes. Track's a good starting point to be able to do it, but I cannot emphasize enough, and I think it is your concern, and I'm, I'm, uh, that we should not be trading off effectiveness in the way that we're doing this. I remember being uh, told that at one point I think we used a cheaper grade of wood for the ties. I think we were using pine instead of oak that deteriorated a lot faster, so we were penny-wise and pound-foolish, and I hope that type of thing doesn't get repeated as we search for more, more cost-effective ways. Fair, fair, fair point all the way around, and I think it will be one of the challenges for us as a committee to make sure that we're looking at what's coming back to us and right. thinking about it and doing that. But uh, very supportive of this work, and, and Carmen and I spoke the other day about some other ideas that he has 
um, within New York City Transit for ways that he thinks they can improve the performance and, and reduce costs at the same time. Um, and I think that's very exciting. I think, I think having a base of a good solid track allows us to be able to do that. Um, and I think we're, we're now moving to a different, a different space mm -hmm. on this. So thank you to everybody who's been, uh, uh, everyone who's been doing it. Um, I'm sorry. I lost my piece of paper. Which one? What's next? Got it. Uh, okay, we have the updates on the uh, Metro North and Long Island Railroad Infrastructure Program, if I'm not mistaken. From the independent engineer, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, we have no uh, additional uh, comments with regard to the uh, reports that we've uh, uh, included in the uh, CPOC uh, committee report package here. No, uh, no remarkable uh, comments. Any questions on either Metro North or Long Island? These are tabs four and five. On the issue of positive train control, um, that's been discussed in various committees before. Um, it's my recollection that one branch of the Long Island and perhaps at least one branch of Metro North were going to ask for a waiver from the federal government on the issue of positive train control by, by virtue of the number of frequencies that, that happen on those lines. I think the Greenport and the Danbury branch may be the two uh, categories, uh, the it, two lines. It's slightly more complicated than that. If you want, I can ask Howard to give a quick update. Is that, sure. Howard, do you, can you get one off the fly? I'm, you know, Both railroads had to submit what was called an implementation plan in April. Um, as part of that plan for Metro North, we requested a waiver for the Waterbury branch um, in the state of Connecticut. Um, I will point out as well, though, that we also are looking for an exemption at Grand Central Terminal, which is because of the nature of how Grand Central is signaled and the difficulty, if not impossibility, to put positive train control in there. Um, the Long Island Railroad, to my memory, they are, they are asking for an exemption at, at Penn Station. It's the same issue. And I believe it is on the east end. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's correct. Um, Riverhead to Greenport, we're going by lack of frequency. Yep. So we operate uh, freight over part of that, so right. that's why we need temporal separation of freight. So the, I believe the Long Island, your plan was accepted. Is that correct by FRA? And Metro North? It, it was uh, conditionally accepted. Okay. We still have to work out details on temporal separation. And Metro North, they raised certain issues, so we have not been accepted yet. We have to refile our plan. Um, but we are continuing along that path that you described where we would not have positive train control on the uh, Waterbury branch. Expensive proposition in many ways. Um, it's the only part of it. But uh, we'll give, I think we've done it, we did uh, an update on PTC at an earlier meeting. I think we'll give an update uh, at some future meeting. But there are continuing to be discussions uh, taking place with the FRA and the federal government around PTC and trying to see if we can find uh, an effective way forward that, that takes out or mitigates at least some of the risks and, and concerns that we'd expressed. Um, this, this all arises out of the uh, Metrolink crash in, in L.A., I believe. Yeah. That's where the federal government got the uh, impetus for this? Uh, it, well, it, it's, a, it's a statutory requirement right now. I think there is a... Um, I think there is, with the help of APTA and in working with transit properties all across the country, um, and certainly um, with a lot of effort on the part of uh, Howard and Helena and, and uh, others, um, I think we're, we're finally getting to the type of discussion we should be having, which is really looking at what are some of the challenges of being able to do this, what are some of the available time, the, the acceptable time frames, uh, how do we achieve the safety objectives that people have. Um, without putting ourselves in an untoward position in terms of risk and cost like of being able to do it. unfunded mandate. Is that fair, Howard? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And um, 
we are, it's a very slow process. Um, we've had a couple of very small successes. Uh, as Jay mentioned, we are working very much with other agencies. We're actually also talking with the AAR, which is the freight, uh, uh, you know, across the class ones. Um, but it's a very slow process. The act, the act that Jay referenced did come out of the uh, Metrolink accident in Los Angeles. Many of these concepts have been talked about for 15 years or 20 years. And the accident served as the impetus for the act that got passed in October 08. Just one last question. Did that act come with any monies for the various transit agencies? No, there is almost no funding for PTC. If my memory serves me correctly. Commuter rail across the country is about two or three billion dollars. I think the freights is about 10 billion, and they've so far appropriated, I think, 50 million. I think one of the houses now has a proposal to raise it to 75. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. So, um, that was a small success. Right. I, it is a very difficult issue. I actually even had a conversation with the, the head of APTA this morning on, on exactly this topic. I mean, I think he would caution that we are making uh, some modest steps at finally in the right direction. But uh, it remains a very complicated and difficult issue. So, I mean, I think it's all around. Uh, we'll keep reporting back to this committee and to the, uh, to the commuter rail group on, on this. Um, okay. We, we, um, we wanted to have one more discussion, if we could, which is um, Barry uh, Kluger, uh, as the Inspector General, shared with me and, and with Linda recently some work that, that he's been doing, uh, which was looking at our capital program, uh, essentially assessing the governance and effectiveness of the way that we're doing some of the, the oversight of our capital program. Um, as I listened to his presentation, it seemed to me that um, recalling and remembering that, in fact, this is an obligation of the board, not of the staff, uh, it was important for Barry to be able to present directly to this committee his findings. I didn't want them to be summarized in any other uh, in any other way, but I wanted the committee to hear his findings. Um, at the end of this, uh, I'd like to have a short executive session, if, if I can, but I think it's important to hear it. He's, Barry's also been assisted by Nick DeMola, for those of you um, who may not remember Nick. Um, uh, Nick was a, the longtime uh, head of the audit and auditor general here for the for the MTA, um, and I actually had the pleasure, uh, I think almost from literally the first day I walked in the door of, uh, of working with Nick, and Nick actually I think undertook some of this work for Barry, if I'm not mis mistaken. So anyway, Barry, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief because I know you have a lot of important business. Uh, just as a simple overview, uh, the chairman took half of what I would talked about, but I was glad that uh, he and Linda really wanted to listen to the work that we were doing. Some time ago, uh, we started to work on two broad projects relative to oversight of the capital program and the mega projects in particular. In one of the studies, uh, we're currently reviewing the MTA's Office of Construction Oversight, the OCO's utilization of the services of the MTA's independent engineer, to identify, analyze, and resolve issues that arise in major capital projects managed by capital construction. As I am well aware through our meetings that the chairman and this committee has been looking into these issues as well as you work through the problems regarding uh, the risk assessments and budgets and, and overruns, uh, I felt that, and as did the chairman, that in advance of publishing a formal report that I bring to your attention some of the highlights or some of the issues uh, that I think that are there in advance of the report. Uh, we've interviewed a few of the board members, certainly the president of Capital Construction, executives at the MTA, uh, Office of Construction Oversight, president past independent engineer. Our staff has attended numerous meetings of this committee. Uh, they've learned a lot. We've looked at the IEC's contract uh, that they have with you as well as the reports of both MTA Capital Construction and the IEC. Uh, as a general overview, I, I do believe that your overall structure in monitoring the, the, the mega projects appear to be sound. And it's really through the work of this committee 
that monitors all aspects of the program, chaired, of course, by the, the chairman, includes all the chairs of the operating committees and the engagement of the independent engineer uh, created by statute as a resource to the board in the discharge of its responsibility. Uh, I believe now that the change that has already been made with capital construction reporting uh, to the operating committees can improve the communication between the operating and uh, between the operating and capital interests. Uh, we do view this as a very positive step because we believe the committees are better positioned to assess to assess the working relationship, coordination, and support of the construction management and the operating teams. Uh, however, uh, and now I guess I have to get to the meat of it. However, we do believe that problems exist regarding the role and accountability of the independent engineer, particularly as it relates to the mega projects, mega projects being managed uh, by uh, being being managed by capital construction. Uh, we believe that the key roles and responsibilities of the IEC and the Office of Construction Oversight and Capital Construction need to be clarified by this committee to avoid unproductive conflicts between the IEC and capital, and capital construction. Uh, we believe in looking at all the different reports that you get at your monthly meetings, we believe that capital construction should have the primary responsibility for submitting comprehensive reports on the status of the mega projects as opposed to the IEC. We believe that the IEC should then respond, reporting to this committee on the issues that they believe will cause significant cost increases, serious schedule delays, and reductions in the scope of the project. Rather than get involved in some of the nitty gritty through a lot of the looking at the reports, we find that the IEC is reporting many low-level issues uh, that I think mask some of the important issues that you really want to do this, and this way you could have the IEC report on some of those smaller issues, less significant issues, report them, deal with them through the Office of Construction Oversight, and elevate them to this committee if necessary. This will enable the committee to focus on the risks connected to budget and schedule, which obviously is a prime responsibility here. Uh, in reviewing the reports themselves, we believe that both the IEC and capital construction need to report in a more clear, concise, and meaningful fashion to this committee. I believe it would assist you if they had executive summaries, clear impact statements, and deadlines for action. We believe that these reports should emphasize issues affecting project milestones and potential impact on the project's budget and schedule. Uh, outstanding issues should be tracked and the status regularly reported to CPOC for follow-up meetings. In many of instances when we've been here, we see important issues sometimes come before you and you've got so many other issues here in the follow-up meeting, it doesn't appear that there is the follow-up either by the IEC or capital construction in whether they accepted the recommendation and if they did accept the recommendation, uh, are they moving forward uh, toward that implementation? Of course. And, and obviously, I should say, over the last few months, we have seen vast improvement in the way this committee addresses and attacks some of these issues. But I do believe that some of our recommendations here will, will enable you to look at this in a more clear and concise manner. Uh, expectations and priorities, I believe, should be set. I think you need a complete review of the IEC and what you expect from them. I believe that the base contract of the IEC is basically the same for years and years and years with some enhancements and some changes in the scope of, of their responsibilities. Uh, but I believe you should review this contract and its current focus on monitoring and how much attention should be devoted to the issues of risk as well as the balance of how much attention do you want the IEC to devote to the mega projects or the, uh, the core projects. Uh, the contract itself right now still calls for 75% of, uh, of, the, of their efforts 
uh, to be in project monitoring. And in reviewing in our discussions with them, it appears that they spend upwards of over 90 percent of the contract funds on project man monitoring rather than value-added programmatic reviews and risk assessments. Uh, I believe that this is something in your bailiwick and something that you should be looking at. Uh, we believe that OCO, that the Office of Construction Oversight in this committee should direct the IEC to prepare an annual risk-based work plan that is reviewed with and approved uh, by, by the committee. Uh, we also believe that you, they should provide you with semi-annual status reports on its performance against that plan its accomplishments, and the summaries on the major issues and the status of their corrective actions. The IEC's performance should be evaluated. Uh, I don't believe they've been formally evaluated for some time. That their performance should be evaluated by the Office of Construction Oversight in consultation with the operating committee chairs as well. We believe that they should develop criteria to measure the IEC's performance to determine whether the IEC under the present contract is providing a value-added service. Uh, as I stated earlier at the beginning, uh, we do plan on submitting a full report on these and other issues uh, pertaining to the oversight of the mega projects. I hope that some of the issues that I've raised today will assist you in further fulfilling your obligations and responsibilities uh, as you move forward. Thank you very much. Um, anything else you want to add, Nick? You guys yeah, all said you're covered. Um, discussion, questions? I'll be fast. Go ahead. Promise. I, I, I thought actually the quality of the IEC reports had improved pretty dramatically versus what we were getting from the prior IEC. And their, their accountability is to us as the board, correct? Right. So, and hopefully it's, you say through the operating committee chairs, but I would hope that any oh, board I meant, member. Uh, yeah, I wasn't would, leaving you out. I, the primary responsibility is here. They work for you. That's correct. And, and I certainly understand that. And my feeling is not to detract from it. My recommendations here are to make sure that they are even more accountable to you based on more clearer reports. If, uh, for example, you've got capital construction. They're building the project. When you're looking at the reports, I looked at some of one of the months, and I saw two pages on the report from Capital Construction, and then an entire voluminous report by the IEC. Some big ticket items, middle, small ones. Mm -hmm. Just from the standpoint of governance to assist you, I would feel that the entity that's responsible for building the project has the response, the primary responsibility to report to you mm -hmm. as to where they are on this project, what the problems are, and IEC then as who you contract with to do an analysis of that report. We found a bit of a disconnect, if, if I may say, in, in many of these reports and the fact that so many of these smaller issues were in there, I think that some of these major issues got lost and it was more difficult for you to track them. At the same time, IEC should be in a position to hold capital construction responsible for you for some of these issues. Are they accepting the recommendation? Or are they not? Why not? You have to make that decision. Nick, does that, do you yeah, want to add to that? I think, you know, from my perspective, kind of use the term, and we've, I've done some of this work in, at the corporate level, um, we kind of use the word from an audit committee perspective, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the, the agency responsible should be reporting. And management has to have trust in that agency. But there's a responsibility by the board to have somebody verify that the information that they're getting is accurate. And then that's really where we, we believe that it would be more effective to have that role of the IEC, whereby they're working with you, they're looking at the information reported by, by, by MTACC, and then if they're in disagreement, that it should be raised, but also they should be confirming that what they're telling you. And then I think the other big part of it is the issue of risk. I think it's important for the board to be advised of risk before it occurs, not after it happens. So I think, you know, I think that's one of the other things that they, that they should be addressing, that as you go down certain paths, because risk changes as the project moves along, you look at the risk factors and see what impact it has. And then to, to even pick up a point that Jay made, you know, sometimes you address an issue 
and then without understanding there may be uh, unintended consequences. And again, I believe that's part of the role of the IEC, that if, if, if there's an issue and they want to change direction, that may be the right direction to go, but there may be consequences that result from that, and you, have to be, and you should be aware of that before it occurs. Not, you shouldn't be informed of that as it's occurring or after it occurs. So can, that's how, you know, from a, from a conceptual perspective, how I think the roles would, would play out a little bit more effectively. But again, it's one of those things where, you know, you have to feel comfortable uh, in, in moving along this direction. It may be something that needs to kind of evolve to that point. But uh, again, I just think that, you know, just to reiterate, um, I, you know, the NTACC is responsible for building, so I don't understand why they shouldn't be responsible for and reporting. And I, Thank you. I came to that same conclusion looking at this. I was saying, wait, they're doing it. They're the ones who got to report to you. And then utilize the IEC to challenge them rather than have this conflict that you're aware that is going on between the two of them and the lack of cooperation. By explaining this in your own words, I got more ahead of that than I did, frankly, okay. through this, so uh, thank you. I usually try to do that, but I was told I had to do this as a PowerPoint today. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have heard my the way I usually speak with you when I go over these issues. Uh, 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 obviously, um, there are a variety of reporting issues in relation to these mega projects, but from a from a constituency standpoint, the two most important issues are cost and timing. Mm -hmm. How you get to those are the details, which I leave, you know, which are below the radar screen. But those are the two main issues that the constituency mm -hmm. wants to know, and I think what this board wants to know. You know, how much is it going to cost us, and when are we going to get finished? Everything else relates to that. We obviously, at the moment, have some significant differences of opinion regarding a number of the mega projects between a variety of entities, some internal to MTA, some external to MTA in that regard. How do it, whose responsibility, in your opinion, should it be to resolve those inconsistencies or differences of opinion or disagreements or whatever other terminology I can come up with at the moment. Because that's really, that's where I'm coming from. You know, whose responsibility is that and who is supposed to verify which of those entities, nothing is true. You only know it's true after it's finished. But at least you have more benefit of the doubt as to one set of justifiable situations than you may have to another. Uh. Uh, my answer, and again, I'll, I'll do plain talk. The buck stops here. I mean, it, ultimately, it's your responsibility. And what I'm recommending here is that utilize these entities in a, in a better way so that you can come to that conclusion. Yes, you're going to have situations where capital construction is going to say yes, and the, uh, X and the, and the independent engineer is going to say Y. But by you making sure that they report in a clear and concise way, give you those summaries, set up the fact that they've now got a report and do follow up at the at the next meeting, and take a look at that contract and you determine what do you really want this IEC to do? Do you really want them? Do you want them to consider continue to do ninety five percent project monitoring? as opposed to the issues. That's exactly our point, yeah. that yeah. the issues of cost and delays yeah. is what everybody's talking about, right. and I believe that you have to work with your IEC, whatever entity you have, reviewing the work of capital construction, which is statutory, right. yeah. to make sure that they do that, and you have to resolve these issues and then make your decisions. I mean, yeah. while it's because, because in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, while it's really nice to know how much dirt was taken out, Mm -hmm. What I want to know is when is the dirt finished? Exactly. Yeah. Not how much was taken out yeah. each day or each week, but how does that get us to the yeah. end result, and, which and, is the operational nature of the project? And I believe and I that a lot of these reports are spending too much time on how much dirt and how much dirt is left, as opposed to getting into the real issues and the risk based analysis, the analytical, the, the last presentation. Yeah. You were talking about the issues of, of uh, wh whether you're doing the, the proper analytical assessments of issues versus ane anecdotal issues that you have and, and, and what's going on. There's, there's too much of that in those reports. And, Mitch, I think, you know, I think, again, I still believe that 
and I go back to my world as the chief order, and I make a recommendation. It's responsibility of the, the people responsible ultimately have to make a decision of whether or not they're going to accept that recommendation and implement it. So I think here, again, using your example, I mean, I, I still believe that it's MTACC that should be responsible. I think the role of the IEC then would be to confirm. If they disagree, they have to state the reason why. Uh, was it a failure to fight because of a lessons learned? Have you experienced this problem in the past and you're going down that same path? Uh, is it against industry standards? Is it not a, you know, maybe doing something different would be a better practice? Again, what they're doing is they're providing the board then with the information to either have MTACC go forward and monitor and report whether or not it's working or basically say, we're not, you know, you've done this two or three times in the past. We think the course of action should be as follow. And that's really where I think, I mean, you know, in that role, I think you, you'd be getting the information to make more there, informed decisions. There is somewhat of a similarity also between my role. I issue reports. I, I came before the board and spoke about our last report where all the findings and recommendations on the A system, on the all agency. And the, the agency has a responsibility to accept them, and if not, why not? Well, you've got the same situation here. The IC is works for you. You charge them. If not, why not? And you make the decision as, as to which side you believe if they're in conflict. Thank you. Anything else? Could, I'm, since we're all speaking so candidly here, could we hear from the IE about... If, they, if you have any thoughts or observations, given sure. everything you've heard. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the findings of this uh, current uh, report, I would like to reserve comment with regard to uh, most of the issues that were brought, since we have not heard this until just now, so I'd like to have an opportunity to discuss. However, I will add uh, additionally that we have, uh, once upon uh, coming here, we uh, went to an exception-based reporting process, which, as Commissioner Frasca has mentioned, I believe did some – uh, we improved on the process uh, when we came in the beginning of 2009. Now, why would I hear the, uh, the IG asking and, the, and this uh, group uh, also is that we would like, they would like to see more improvement in that area. And we believe that in our discussions with the IG, which I believe were, were frank mm -hmm. and, and open and honest, uh, we have an understanding of that we need to do better follow-up with regard to recommendations. Uh, in, uh, on reporting, especially with MTA, in regard to MTACC. Um, in areas where there is disagreement, uh, we could do uh, an improved job in that area, we feel, by going back and, and discussing such recommendations, why they were not implemented by MTACC if, not, if, uh, if they were not, for instance, and then provide that openness to, the, uh, to this committee to uh, make a decision on. Some of the reporting that we've done, I would clearly say, appears to be uh, some voluminous and that there perhaps may have been the perception that we were digging too deep into the weeds in some areas. And I would like to say with regard to that, that at times it's necessary to establish the certain facts in order to make decisions and de determine whether or not the facts are what we're being presented with are, are be, can be verified to be true. Uh, we don't need to put that in writing to this group, uh, but we at times feel that we need to get to that depth to determine what the actual result is of what their work. Thank you. I think um, for my sins, having been one of the people who helped set up the IEC process many moons ago, the, one of the things that is different here is that we didn't have the kind of projects we're doing out of MTACC at that time. I mean, we, we, we set up the IEC really to help us get a control over a program that, that was dispersed and making investments, you know, many smaller investments in many different ways. You know, the idea of projects that would have a cost of $5 billion or $8 billion was beyond anyone's realm of, of imagination at that uh, point in time. I think one of the points that is coming through this is that it may well be that we need collectively just to adjust a little bit to that. And, and in, in our thinking, in the way we use and, and scope the IEC work and think about that, and, and they may need to make some adjustments as well. But, but you know, it, it is not surprising in some ways that something that was designed for one purpose may need to adjust a little bit to deal with something that's a little bit different right now. Mark? I guess I, I'm a little bit sort of mystified in terms of the thrust of what we're doing here. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we have the sort of line staff agency of the MTA that's responsible for 
executing the capital program and ultimately responsible to us for saying what they're up to. And there's a, a degree of the IEC that is, I mean, we seem to be saying that whatever they say is going to be sort of a flash of, an enlight of enlightenment in the darkness that we otherwise have with our own staff carrying out the program and telling us about it. And it just, I mean, it just doesn't, s s I, I don't think that's likely to be true. I mean, at the end of the day, if it really is, then we have a huge problem in terms of our own operating entity. And I guess what you've been saying, I'm sorry, I'm running my mouth because I'm sort of mystified, is that maybe a constructive way to use this resource as opposed to just saying that they're supposed to uh, snipe a certain amount is on your, your, your analytical stuff. I mean, of really, if you want to stand back and look at how we're doing track, how do you do it? And having somebody with, with the sort of professional depth and skill to help you on that sounds really constructive to me. It's sort of, you can get very bogged, in, and I guess I'm familiar with it in sort of a QA um, role. I mean, if you have a really assiduous QA contractor, they can tie you in knots. But whether they've actually, if the knots have, have gotten you anywhere constructive, I guess the bottom line is it's good we're thinking about this. I think, from my perspective, I found the points that, that the IG was making to actually be helpful in, in highlighting some of this. Um, I think as a committee we do need to think about it and we do need to form and make sure we, we feel we get the best value out of what we're doing. And, and I say that not just in terms of the dollars being spent, but where we can really be protecting what might be our other costs that we would, would be doing. And it's not always clear that we do that by, by going over in even more depth the exact same things over, over and over again. I think your point, Mark, about the fact that the fundamental responsibility for the delivery of our capital programs rests with either MTACC in the case of the mega projects or with, um, you know, one of our operating agencies in the, in the case of the other projects, I think has from day one been the role of the, you know, the, 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 the management of the program and, and I think strongly should remain that. Um, equally, we as a board um, want to have a little bit of comfort about that and be able to bring a little bit of, of due diligence and oversight into that, and we discharge some of that by, by bringing a little bit of, of additional help in doing that. How we balance that and find the way to be able to do that, I think, is the question that's being raised here. But I think it, it in the first instance, um, I think the report that's been put forth by um, the IG is a report really not to the IEC, but in the first instance is a report to us. And, and that, that was the way, that at least that I, I saw it as our, our point here. Uh, th that was my point. I mean, and why I shared it, I did engage in this, embark on this about nine months ago, and that's when we started to do some of this review. I was able to convince uh, Mr. DeMola to help us out on this. Uh, but it was really to assist this board. It wasn't necessarily to take a shot at any particular entity. It was just that what we saw and what we gleaned from the interviews and very candid interviews, as the gentleman from the IEC noted. Everybody was most cooperative and very candid that there are issues that need, need to be resolved, and I think that you all know that. So we're not just in a sniping, and you use that term, that they're there as snipers. That, that, that's exactly our point, that they have to be there as, as a resource for you with an expertise at the same time that the agency has the primary responsibility. You also have the Office of Construction Oversight and Linda here and everybody else, but we just felt that maybe we could take a step back. It's been worked this way for so long under the same contract that maybe our office, and I certainly don't have the depth of experience that any of you have on these issues, but maybe that helped me, that I was able to kind of take a step back from it and look at it really from a common sense perspective. Uh, in terms of all these entities here that you have, and each one of them can really contribute something with the ultimate goal of dealing uh, with your risk and, and dealing with cost overruns and delays and the completion of these projects. And it's in that spirit that I come here. I'm not trying to tell anybody how to do their job. 
Okay. I, I'd like to, if I can, wrap this discussion. We have the need for a uh, very brief executive session to, for purposes of discussion of matters relating to appointment, employment, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular corporation is authorized by Section 105F of the Open Meetings Law. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>